Hi everybody. In this module we're going to be talking about nursery hygiene and the subtitle for this lecture video is Prevention is Better Than Cure or Start Clean, Keep It Clean. The propagation environment provides ideal conditions in which many plant pathogens and pests can proliferate. We frequently have free water, high humidity, warm temperatures, open wounds or cuts on cuttings, grafts and divisions, and soft sappy growth on young plants that's easy for pathogens or the piercing or sucking mouth parts of insects to penetrate. And we've got plants growing in close proximity. Pests, pathogens, algae, mosses and liverworts can all have an absolute field day in this kind of environment. There are plenty of pesticides we can use to treat the pests, pathogens, algae, mosses, liverworts and weeds, but chemicals are expensive. We have to pay somebody to apply them. They're not good for the environment and they're not that pleasant for the applicator either. So doing our best to prevent pests and diseases from entering the propagation environment in the first place is a more sustainable and more cost effective strategy. In this unit, we're going to look at some of the steps we can take to prevent pests and pathogens from entering the nursery and our propagation area. And most of these steps also apply when we're growing at home as well. This may seem like a rather depressing topic, but it's an essential one and there are positive messages. So this lecture is not quite as negative as it might seem. By the end of this unit, you'll be able to provide economic and environmental reasons for the importance of nursery hygiene. You'll be able to describe the main steps we can take to reduce the risk of pests and pathogens entering the propagation environment. And you'll be able to describe one of the ways in which you could start compiling a set of best management practices or BMPs for pest and disease prevention in a plant production setting. So let's start by making sure that we all know what nursery hygiene refers to. Nursery hygiene refers to the steps that we take to keep our propagation and growing areas clean and as free as possible from pests, diseases and weeds. A good approach to nursery hygiene is that prevention is better than cure or start clean, keep it clean. So why is nursery hygiene important? Well, firstly, we want to provide our customers with clean plants that are free of any known pests or diseases. Our reputation's at stake if we don't do this and we'll lose business if we consistently provide customers with diseased or underperforming plant material. Secondly, we always want to optimize our rooting success with cuttings and maximize the number of seedlings that establish when we're growing from seed. If we have poor nursery hygiene, it may result in us losing significant numbers of plants to disease at each stage of production. This can add significantly to our costs of production. Not only are we paying people to stick cuttings and sow seed that then dies if we have poor hygiene practices, we also have to pay the labour costs of removing and dumping that diseased material from the propagation and production areas. And thirdly, it's the law. Licensed nurseries are inspected once a year by an inspector from the County Agricultural Commissioner's Office to make sure the nursery is free of any obvious pests, diseases and weeds. You may have your license suspended or be told to clean up your operation if your nursery isn't observing good hygiene practices. Nurseries are inspected more frequently if they're growing crops affected by specific pests and diseases that are subject to either state or federal quarantines or that prevent a risk to agriculture and horticulture or our wildlands if they continue to spread. In California, quarantines are currently in place for several pests and diseases, including Elbam, the light brown apple moth, which is native to New Zealand and was introduced to California over 10 years ago. It causes disfiguring damage on a range of fruit crops and has a wide range of host plants, including many ornamental shrubs and perennials. And the ornamental nursery sector has been blamed for the spread of this insect. 
Of particular concern in California right now is the Asian citrus psyllid, which is the vector for the bacterial disease HLB, or citrus greening. Florida has already lost over 50% of its citrus industry to this disease, and there are concerns it may do the same in California, where our citrus industry is worth $1.2 billion a year. For some years, there have been strict regulations in place for the propagation and movement of citrus plants, and it's illegal for any nursery that isn't approved to be propagating any type of citrus. In general, a discovery of a re regulated pest or causal agent of a disease in a nursery can result in the nursery being shut down by, by the County Agricultural Commissioner, by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, or by the US Department of Agriculture. Usually, the closure is temporary, while the nursery eradicates whatever pest it was that was discovered. In the case of the light brown apple moth, a temporary shutdown may last just 24 hours, while an approved pesticide is applied that's effective against both Lepidopteran larvae and eggs. But a shutdown may last indefinitely while a nursery cleans up its production practices. It can then only reopen after being reinspected and being declared clean by an inspector. Inspectors also have the power to order that a crop be destroyed if necessary in order to, to contain the spread of a disease or pest. If a nursery is not able to clean up its production practices and has repeat positive finds of a particular pest or pathogen, then it may result in the permanent closure of the nursery. Even if the nursery is able to prove it's free of the pet pathogen or pest, its reputation may have suffered to the extent where it has to close because it's lost too much business and is no longer financially viable. So the message here is don't let this picture on the right be you. The importance of good nursery hygiene and vigilance regarding pests and diseases extends beyond the protection of our own businesses and the ag and the hort industry. They also extend the protection of our natural landscapes and ecosystems. There are some pests and pathogens which can become established in our wildlands where they can have serious impacts on our natural landscapes and ecosystems. A good example of this is the water mold organism Phytophthora romorum, which is the causal agent of sudden oak death. It's estimated that 50 million trees have died in California and Oregon forests in the last 30 years as a result of Phytophthora romorum, which was introduced unintentionally to the wild through infected plants from the nursery trade. Tan oak has been the main victim of sudden oak death, as you can see in the picture on the right here, but coast live oak and a number of other native shrubs and trees have also been lost. This photo here is an aerial view of a section of the mixed evergreen forest down at Big Sur, and you can see a pattern of trees that are dead or dying here from sudden oak death. So what does good nursery hygiene involve? Firstly, it helps to have some knowledge of pests and diseases, their life cycles and the conditions in which they thrive. So we know what we're trying to prevent and can identify the problem if and when it does show up. Some pests and diseases are specific to certain crops, but many, especially water and soil-borne organisms such as Pythium and Phytophthora, which are both water molds, are common to all nursery types and propagation systems. So none of us should be thinking that we're immune from any of these problems. Pests and diseases that are new to California appear from time to time. So it's important to stay current with what's going on in the industry. And ideally, every growing operation should have its own set of best management practices, or BMPs, for disease prevention. In this class, our focus is obviously just on propagation. And in the workplace, in real life, we can put together best management practices just for the propagation area. 
but all of our good work goes down the drain if the rest of the nursery or the growing operation that we work for or with isn't also part of the process. So ideally, BMPs should cover the entire production process from start to finish and not just propagation. Lastly, compiling a set of BMPs isn't the end of the process. Workers need to be trained and receive continuing education. We need to adhere to the BMPs and we need to update them as needed. They're not something that just looks pretty sitting on the office shelf for when the county ag inspector comes visiting. Workers should also be empowered to comment and contribute to the process. So where do we start? Preparing a set of BMPs sounds daunting and like a lot of work. But the good news is that we don't need to start from scratch. There was a comprehensive set of BMPs put together in, I think, 2003 by the Plant California Alliance, or as it was known then, the California Association of Nurseries and Garden Centers, in cooperation with the California Farm Bureau, the Horticultural Research Institute, and several other industry organizations. The focus of these BMPs was the prevention of Phytophthora remorum, the causal agent of sudden oak death. But these BMPs can be adapted for any pest and disease and any ag or hot growing operation. There's also another set of BMPs for nurseries for Phytophthora remorum on the website of Phytosphere Research and also sample documentation that we can use on the SANC website. SANC stands for Systems Approach to Nursery Certification. Putting together a comprehensive set of BMPs typically involves a systems approach. This holistic process involves breaking down our whole production line into individual components or stages and then identifying and evaluating the risk potential at each critical stage. Having identified the risks at each stage, we then put in place best management practices which either minimize the risk or eliminate it altogether. This systems approach isn't new. It's been around in the food industry and non-ag and hort sectors for over 30 years. One of the most commonly used systems approaches that you might have heard of is HACCP, H-A-C-C-P, which stands for Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point, which is used extensively in the food industry and production of food crops so that there's always backwards traceability in the event of an outbreak of a pathogen such as E. coli or Salmonella that are harmful to humans. A simple systems approach might start by identifying the main stages in our production process as shown in the very, very simple diagram here. Our systems approach starts by looking at all of our inputs and then at the nursery layout and the layout of individual work areas or departments and their production practices. And we're going to look at this diagram more closely in one of our labs. But let's spend some time now looking at some of the steps we can take to improve our nursery hygiene. And we're going to start by looking at our inputs, plant material, containers and potting media. One strategy of reducing risk might be to avoid growing high risk plants. For example, in nursery inspections, over 70% of positive Phytophthora remorum detections used to be on Camellia and Rhododendron. So it might be a good idea to avoid growing these high risk plants. Right now, high risk plants in California might be considered any citrus and members of the citrus family that are hosts to the Asian citrus psyllid and HLB. Many nurseries supplement their own in-house propagation by purchasing plugs or liners from specialist nurseries. Some nurseries may even buy in all of their plants from specialist plug and liner nurseries and not do any of their own in-house propagation. If we're buying plants in, 
we should make sure that we buy plugs and liners only from reputable licensed nurseries that also have best management practices in place and are in compliance with any phytosanitary laws and regulations. Ideally, any plants brought into the nursery should be quarantined and observed for symptoms before placing them in the nursery with other plants. As far as containers are concerned, we should use only new containers or used containers that have been sterilized. Don't accept used containers back from customers because you don't know where the containers have been. They may have been lying on the ground on bare soil underneath a bay laurel or tan oak or manzanita that has sudden oak death. And you don't want to be bringing that disease back into the nursery. Dirty used containers should be stored separately from clean containers and away from any production areas in a place where any rainwater running off them won't contaminate clean containers, potting media or any plant material. We should always buy our potting media from a reputable source that has quality control systems in place and only sources all the ingredients that go into their potting mixes from reliable, clean sources. Most nurseries in this area buy their media from Berger Sunland in Watsonville. Berger is a large Canadian company that bought the local company Sunland Garden Products about 10 years ago. We should never reuse used potting media unless it's been steam sterilized because there's a high chance that there are going to be pathogens in that used potting mix. It's always a good idea to cover any piles of potting media when they're not in use to prevent weed seeds from blowing in. And on a practical note, covering piles of potting media in the winter also keeps the rain out and prevents it from becoming too wet and heavy, which can make it harder for machinery to handle and can put a strain on potting machines. Never store growing media in contact with native soil, even if it's in bags. Preferably store it up off the ground on pallets if it's in bags. If it's bulk media that was delivered in a transport trailer, then it should be stored on a concrete pad. Don't store media in standing water or where water can drain into it, as you can see in the photo on the right here. Consider steam sterilizing potting mixes if you're growing high risk crops, such as California native plants for revegetation and restoration projects, where there's zero tolerance of any pathogens in the potting mix. But don't steam sterilize media that has fertilizer in it. Do the steam sterilization first and then add any fertilizer that you need to use. We'll talk more about mother stock in our module on cuttings, but for ve vegetative propagation, we should always start with clean, healthy mother stock. Our stock plants should be well hydrated, no obvious nutrient deficiencies, no obvious pests or diseases. If we're collecting cuttings from the wild or from a cultivated landscape, we should make sure that there aren't, to the best of our knowledge, any plants infected with Phytophthora in the vicinity. We should try to collect cutting material from stems that are at least two feet above the ground, if possible. I realize this isn't possible if we're collecting material from ground cover plants that grow to perhaps just a, a few inches to a foot tall. And collecting from two feet above the ground also applies to seed collection as well, if possible. The reason for that this is that water droplets from overhead irrigation or rain can bounce back up from the ground onto the foliage of plants, carrying soil-borne pathogens with them. Normally though, water droplets don't bounce any higher than two feet. The photo on the right here shows lavender stock plants at Takao Nursery in Fresno where they maintain all the stock plants in a greenhouse on metal benches. Takao specializes in the production of plugs that are shipped all over the country. 
and a positive find of Phytophthora would prevent them from shipping out of state and probably also within California and would also be a horrible negative strike against their reputation. Propagules is a term that refers to any plant part that we're using for propagation. If we're growing from seed, then the seeds are our propagules. If we're growing ferns, then the spores are our propagules. And in vegetative propagation, whatever plant part we're using is our propagule. And it could be stems, roots, bulbs, or other plant parts. Before collecting cuttings, we should disinfect our clippers, disinfect any containers that the cuttings are going to be collected in, and if, if possible, avoid putting the containers that we're going to collect the cuttings in on the ground. Before you bring propagules into the preparation area, get everything ready. Fill the plug trays or containers with the appropriate meter, media, surface disinfect, benches, work surfaces, containers, and any hand tools. And disinfect your clippers or knives regularly while you're preparing cuttings or grafting. Disinfect all surfaces in between crops and wear gloves all the time, not just to protect the plants, but also to protect yourself and any workers from chemicals that are being used or from any dust that's in the potting media. Try to create a logical workflow. So for example, you bring cutting material in at one end of the production line and as it's prepared, it moves one step down the production line, getting closer each time to the greenhouse or whatever structure the plants you're propagating are going to end up in. This process makes propagation much more efficient and it's usually safer as you're not bumping into your colleagues or tripping over hoses. Some nurseries surface sterilize propagules. And you may remember that in our module on seed, I mentioned disinfecting seed with bleach solutions or hydrogen peroxide. And I also mentioned that hot water baths for killing pathogens inside the seed are sometimes used. You may also remember though that these treatments can also damage the seed and that the temperature and length of time for which a seed is given a hot water bath can be species specific. So what I'm saying is take great care if you're going to be surface sterilizing seed and do a lot of research beforehand. The same advice applies to cuttings and other vegetative plant parts. If you're collecting cuttings from your own mother stock, you could use systemic pesticides to spray the stock plants ahead of time to kill any endogenous pathogens. This isn't an option that you have though if you're growing organically, as I don't think there are any organic approved systemic pesticides that are effective against fungal, bacterial, viral and water mold pathogens. You can surface sterilize cuttings and other vegetative plant parts with a solution of sodium hypochlorite or bleach or Xerotol, which is a hydrogen peroxide based product. But you have to weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of surface sterilization. Firstly, it only kills pathogens that are on the exposed external surfaces. It's not going to kill any endogenous pathogens that are in the vascular system or any other internal tissues. Sterilizing plant parts can stress the plant material, which may result in lower rooting percentages, which is something that we never want in propagation. This is also another step in the production process, so it adds to our production costs because of the extra time and labor involved. There are also disposal issues with getting rid of the sterilization chemical afterwards and you're exposing your workers or yourself to another chemical, which may be something that you don't want to do. Nurseries growing native plants for restoration and revegetation projects 
are held to extremely high hygiene standards and there's zero tolerance for any pathogens. If you find yourself working with a restoration or a revegetation nursery, then you should refer to the best management practices that are on the website of Phytosphere Research. Some nurseries place foot baths at entrances to propagation areas so that workers and visitors aren't trekking in pathogens on their footwear. Footwear should be as free as possible from any soil or organic matter before using the foot bath as the chemicals in the foot baths are usually inactivated after contact with organic matter. Some research and plant breeding operations have highly sensitive areas where hygiene is paramount. So Tyvek suits, booties and head coverings may be, may be required for some high risk areas. The photo on the right here was taken when I was on an IPPS, the International Plant Propagators Society, tour of some of the research greenhouses at uh, Wageningen in the Netherlands. Cicada seed in Salinas also has a super highly sensitive area where you have to get suited up like this. I've already said wear gloves and change them regularly. And this is a reminder to disinfect your tools regularly as well. Always remove weeds from plants from the nursery and from around the nursery as weeds can be host plants for pests. Grazing animals such as deer and rabbits should also be excluded if possible from the nursery and the growing grounds as they can carry pathogens and weed seeds on their feet and mouths. Insects can affect propagation in several ways. They can lay their eggs in the substrate or any algae that might be present in the greenhouse and their larvae when they hatch can damage young roots. Also, the wounds caused by their chewing can provide points of entry for secondary pathogens. And an example of this would be the fungus gnat, which lays its eggs in wet potting media or algae in the greenhouse when the eggs hatch the larvae then start nibbling away at roots and they can provide wounds that are particularly suitable for root rot pathogens like Pythium and Phytophthora to enter the plant. Insects with chewing or sucking mouth parts can be vectors of pathogens which are then transmitted to the plant while the insects are eating. We can exclude insects from our propagation and production structures by installing insect screens over intake fans and vents like the one here in the picture on one of the hoop houses at Cabrillo. In particularly sensitive, vulnerable or high risk areas, a positive airflow entry system can be installed. For example, Four Winds Growers in Watsonville, which specializes in the production of over 200 varieties of citrus, has positive airflow fans on all the entrances to its greenhouses in order to exclude the Asian citrus psyllid. Field workers can also be vectors of insects that get trapped in their clothes. So workers shouldn't be allowed to enter high risk areas if they've been working with other lower risk crops at the nursery. Any bare soil should be covered with landscape fabric. This doesn't exclude soil-borne pathogens, but it definitely reduces the risk of splashback onto plants from water droplets. If possible, and if you have the money, install metal benches and avoid using wood for benches as wood can harbor fungal pathogens. Keep any floors clean and sweep up any spilt messes straight away. When you're weeding or pruning, put the weeds and the prunings straight into a large container. This is also quicker and more labor efficient than putting the weeds and the prunings on the ground and then sweeping them up later. 
concrete floors are great. They're really easy to keep clean, but they're super expensive. And they can result in a loss of flexibility if you decide at a later date that you want to change things around. Every nursery has a cull pile where dead and poor quality plants go to their forever homes. Make sure that the cull pile is far away from production areas and that water won't leach from the cull pile into natural landscapes or waterways. Any plants that don't sell should be disposed of or donated if they're still um, in reasonably good condition. There are always schools and nonprofits that are happy to accept donations. Any diseased plants should be removed promptly from propagation and production areas and disposed of in the garbage or composted if you can get the compost pile up to a sufficiently high temperature to kill any pathogens. Many nurseries allow landscape contractors and homeowners to come in and help themselves to soil that's been dumped in the cull pile. So remember this pile of soil may be full of pathogens. So we really shouldn't allow people to come in and um, buy or just take potting media from this pile because it's just spreading pathogens into the larger landscape. We always place plants as close together as possible in order to optimize our use of space. After all, land's ob obscenely expensive in California, so we need to optimize our use of that expensive space. This doesn't always provide ideal conditions for plant growth though, and it also favors the transmission of pathogens between plants. So ideally, we should space plants so that there's good airflow between them so that it reduces humidity and so that the plants don't touch. Most water molds are dispersed in water and in fact repeat positive finds of Phytophthora remorum have been in beds where there's standing water as you can see in the photo on the right here. We should fill in any low spots that water's draining to and if possible, we should put plants on metal benches that are at least two feet high. Although this really isn't practical if you're growing in containers any larger than a six inch or a number one pot. We should always aim to irrigate at a time of day that allows foliage to dry out as quickly as possible so that free water is sitting on the foliage for as short a time as possible. In this next section, I'm going to talk about some of the com commonly used products that are used to disinfect materials in a nursery. Some of the products are also available to home gardeners and amateur growers and are available at the Grow Biz in Santa Cruz. Firstly, a few words of warning though. If you're working with food or anything that's consumed by humans, there may be chemicals you can't use on your plants that are allowed on ornamentals. So always read the label and always use chemicals only in accordance with the instructions on the label. Always wear the recommended PPE, personal protective equipment. And unless it says otherwise on the label, never, ever, ever mix disinfectants as it can result in the production of toxic gases. If necessary, ask for advice about chemicals from the County Agricultural Commissioner's Office. Remember that you need a pesticide license in order to apply chemicals in a commercial setting and that details of any chemical that are applied have to be submitted to the County Agricultural Commissioner every month. The table here shows a summary of some of the most commonly used disinfectants in nurseries. This certainly isn't a complete list, and my recommendation would be to ask for further advice from the County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, or maybe the sales rep for any chemical company that you deal with if you have a specific problem that you're trying to treat. Remember though that sales reps' jobs are to sell, 
So always check any advice that they give you. I'm not suggesting that they deliberately give you bad advice. It's just that often they're not chemists and often they don't have any practical hands-on experience in a nursery. So just double check any information that they give you. So let's look at some of these products in a little more detail, starting with isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol is really good for small tools such as clippers or pruners. It's readily available. We can get it from CVS, or Safeway or Rite Aid, and we can buy it in bulk for a larger scale use in a commercial nursery or growing situation. We don't have to worry about any disposal. It just evaporates. It doesn't stay in our clothes the way that bleach does. And it's really handy for landscape contractors and maintenance gardeners, actually, um, for spraying on hedge trimmers, shears, loppers, pruners and other hand tools in between jobs. And it's also handy for us, too, to carry a spray bottle in our car so that after hiking, we can spray the soles of our shoes or boots so that we're not spreading Phytophthora remorum or any other water mold organisms. And strange but true, 70% isopropyl alcohol can be more effective than 90%. 70% doesn't evaporate quite as quickly as 90%, so it stays on the surface that we're trying to disinfect for longer. Now let's look at bleach or sodium hypochlorite. Sodium hypochlorite is useful on hard surfaces and containers, and we should use it at 5,000 parts per million. And hard surfaces should remain wet for at least five minutes in order to kill all pathogens, including Phytophthora and Pythium. Plant material can also be soaked for at 5,000 parts per million, but only for between 30 and 60 seconds, and then the plant material should be rinsed. But it's really important to note that sodium hypochlorite can be phytotoxic, and not all plant material can tolerate soaking in bleach for this length of time. Disposal of sodium hypochlorite solutions might be a problem. It has a really unpleasant odor and can stain our clothing. The other disadvantage of sodium hypochlorite is that it breaks down really quickly as soon as it comes into contact with organic material and when it's exposed to sunlight. Solutions lose their strength quickly and this means that we need to make up fresh solutions on a regular basis. And we should always check the concentration of any solution that we make up with test strips. The last disadvantage of bleach is that it can be corrosive on aluminum tools, such as um, cheaper clippers. Advantages of bleach are that it's readily available, or it was until COVID hit, and it's relatively cheap to purchase. An alternative sometimes to sodium hypochlorite is quaternary ammonium and products with this as their active ingredient are often just generically referred to as quarks. The products can vary in their efficacy against all pathogens and the exposure times listed on the labels of these products are minimums and they may not always be sufficient to kill all types of Phytophthora spores. So always check the label carefully for specific efficacy claims on quaternary ammonium products. It's also important that surfaces remain wet for as, at least as long as the label recommends. And like sodium hypochlorite, quartz lose their concentration when they're exposed to organic matter. So always mix fresh batches regularly and again, use the appropriate testing strips to check the concentration of any solutions.
There are some mycorrhizal products which claim to be effective against root rot pathogens, particularly Pythium and Phytophthora, which are our two worst root rot enemies in the nursery and especially in the propagation environment. But read the language on the labels of these products really carefully. If a label says that it protects the plant or controls a pathogen, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's killing it completely. The mycorrhizae from the beneficial fungi in these products may just be forming a protective sheath around the roots of our plants or keeping the pathogen at very low levels in the container. So the plant itself may not be infected, but there's still Phytophthora in the potting mix or Pythium in the, in the potting mix. This is somewhat similar to us wearing a mask against COVID-19. The mask gives us some protection, but the virus is still out there. For this reason, mycorrhizal products aren't currently, currently recommended for nurseries where a zero tolerance level of Phytophthora is required. And lastly, after all the talk about chemicals, I think it's good to note that steam is being used more frequently now to disinfect nursery containers. There are purpose-built steam cabinets for disinfecting containers, but some nurseries find it more economical to build their own, often using an old shipping container or even the box from an old box truck. If you're thinking of using steam to steam sterilize your containers, make sure that the containers can withstand the temperature. Some of the more flimsy plug trays probably can't, and you're just going to end up with a big mess of melted plastic in the steam cabinet. Steam is also used in specialist nurseries on potting media when it's essential that the media be completely free of all soil borne pathogens. The downside to this is that only small batches can be done at once, so it's not particularly practical or cost effective for larger nurseries to be doing this. You may be thinking that all this seems like an awful lot of work, but the benefits of having a robust nursery hygiene program can outweigh the downsides, especially if that downside is your business being ordered to close. Taking a critical look at your production systems can also result in production efficiencies. Walla Walla Nursery in Washington was one of the pilot nurseries in the SANC program, the systems approach to nursery certification, and it reported a significant increase in efficiency after going through the accreditation process because it forced them to take a critical look at their production processes and resulted in them improving much of their workflow. Finally, put a positive spin on it and use your adherence to BMPs and your marketing materials, just like Takao Nursery, as you can see on the right in this extract from their website. So now let's summarize what this unit has been about. Nursery hygiene is important because it helps us to supply our customers with high quality, healthy plants. It's important because pest and disease prevention can be more economical than treating pests and diseases with chemicals. And it's important because it's the law. Nursery hygiene practices are super important because they also help to protect our natural ecosystems. A nursery may be ordered to close temporarily and or destroy a crop if inspectors find a regulated pest or disease in the nursery. We can use existing sample documentation to help us put together best management practices for nursery hygiene. We don't have to start the whole process from scratch. Finally, putting together a comprehensive set of BMPs can be time consuming but the process can also identify places where our production systems can become more efficient, thus saving us money and perhaps enabling us to work more safely, sell more plants or provide our customers with much better service. We can also use the BMPs to our advantage in our marketing materials. 
So now that you've listened to the lecture, when you have time, complete the quiz on nursery hygiene and we'll also be revisiting nursery hygiene in class. Thank you.